we start the program with an invocation. Silaye kai kund shivaruva maakund kalayude kalil kai torunne silaye kai kund shivaruva maakund kalayude kalil. Kai toru nen, mula ye chumbi chu, murali yai matriye, muragada padavatam. Kai toru nen, mula ye chumbi chu, murali yai matriye, muragada padavatam. Kai toru nen, sila ye kai. Kalayude kalgalil kai torunne mugan swaramigum mukti prada yiniyam mukam bigeninne kai torunne mugan swaramigum mukti prada yiniyam mukam bigeninne kai torunne kalil silang. exhibition 
at the National Gallery of Modern Art, Bengaluru, sponsored by the Ministry of Culture, Government of India, titled Royal Lithography and Legacy. In 2019, he established the Ganesh Shivaswami Foundation, which immediately thereafter partnered with Google Arts and Culture. To commemorate 125 years, since the establishment of the Ravi Verma Press, his foundation launched promo lithographs from his collection on the Google platform. This was inaugurated by Her Highness Shubhangini Raje, Rajmataji of Baroda in September 2019. The following year, his foundation commemorated 150 years of the artist's professional career through further exhibits on the Google Arts and Culture platform. In March 2021, Ganesh was appointed the honorary curator of the new wing of the Sri Chitra Art Gallery, Tiruvannandapuram, which is specifically dedicated to the works of Ravi Varma and associated artists. Although I must add over here that I think the best Ravi Varma's paintings are in Baroda rather than uh, Tirvanandapuram. Ganesh continues his research on Raja Ravi Varma and is the author of a six volume book series. You can see them here Raja Ravi Varma, an everlasting imprint, which explores the social, religious, and aesthetic impact of the images from the Ravi Varma press on the people of the Indian subcontinent and beyond. And I think you will all agree with me that the effect, the um, impact of Ravi Varma's images have, has entered everybody's homes, in our puja rooms. We all have images of deities, different deities, and most of them are Ravi Varma prints which have been handed down by mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, and so on. In this six-volume series, the first volume deals with the life of Raja Ravi Varma and the elements which inspired his paintings. The second volume charters the journey of the Ravi Varma press and the impact of the prints on various aspects of life. And I think that was such a great uh, thing that Ravi Varma did because, you know, today we have intellectual property rights and everybody wants to patent what little they know. But here was a man who took photographs, took chromo lithographs, sold it, I suppose for the amounts like 5 rupees and 10 rupees in those days, maybe less. But that is how uh, he popularized it. So everybody could become an art collector. Everyone could have a Raja Ravi Varma at home. That is something unique. And I cannot think of any other artist who did it to this extent. The third volume deals with images intended for worship, while the fourth looks into the images from the Srimad Bhagavata and plays. The sixth and concluding volume Sorry, the fourth volume looks into images from, from the Ramayana and Mahabharata. The fifth examines images from the Bhagavatam, while the sixth and concluding volume documents images of people of power and women. A team from the Critical Collective New Delhi, consisting of Gayatri Sinha, Rinalini Vasudevan and Namrata Ghosh, edited the books. Polo Designs Chennai, founded by Ashwat Narod and Alessio Komali, designed the volumes. The series is published by White Falcon Publishing Solutions, Chandigarh. And we have the first volume. Some of the books are available outside if you are interested in buying. In any case, I am very happy that Ganesh Shivaswami has come to Chennai has come to the C.P. Ramaswamy Iyer Foundation and with the Madras Book Club is going to talk about his book, 
Raja Ravi Verma, an everlasting imprint. So good evening everyone. Thank you. Uh, before I actually begin, is everyone able to see the screen? If you are want to, you can shift around a bit. Yeah, yeah I think we should. Sort of. So, a word of gratitude. Nandita Krishna, thank you so much for inviting me, the C.P. Ramaswamy Health Foundation and the Madras Book Club. I have to say that I was at the Madras Book Club about a couple of months ago for Deepthi's talk. I was sitting there and this very kind lady thought I was a Maharaja. So, <laughs> I'm not. I'm actually an author. I'm a lawyer first and then an author later. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, yes, I do want to present to all of you actually the six volumes. It's actually been done, although volume one is the only one which has been released. So, let me take the pleasure of showing it to you like a car salesman. Yeah, okay. So there you go, this is volume 1. This is the volume which has, let me go there, yeah. So this is volume 1, this is the volume which has already been released. Uh, uh, the entire series is titled Raja Ravi Varma, An Everlasting Imprint. And this bears the subtitle, The Shaping of an Artist. So it delves into the life of the artist, not just the artist, but also the, some of the artists who were associated with Ravi Varma. See Raja Raja Varma, etc. And more importantly, how he composes the image. So it's a very technical understanding of how the image comes to be composed. Today I'm going to take you into a sort of a deep dive into this volume. This is volume 1. Then we have volume 2. Volume 2 is the subtitle is a resonant impression and deals with how the image goes from an artist or from a painter into the public space, largely through the agency of the Ravi Varma press. But it also looks into, once the image goes into the public space, it's received differently from how a patron receives it. A patron would have commissioned the painting and said, okay, very beautiful, or change it here, change it there. But when an image goes into the public domain, the public understanding of it is very complex. So it lays down the various ways in which the public receives it. Do they like it? Do they hate it? Do they call him a kitsch artist? Do they call him a calendar artist? And it sort of academically understands what the actual impact of it is. It lays down the framework of it. Now once you have done volume 1 and 2, which is you understand the artist, you understand how it is made, you understand how it gets into the public space through the Ravi Varma press and how the public is receiving it, uh, appreciating it, criticizing it. Once you put one, two, three, four together, we now start looking at each of the sections of images. And we start with volume three. This I think is going to be the most popular volume of the series. This is titled A Divine Omnipresence and it deals with all of the images intended for worship. So your Lakshmis, your Saraswatis, your Parvatis, your Shivas, your Ganapatis. And it is not just the Hindu images. We are also talking about Islamic images. We are talking about Christian images. And we are talking about the sages and pontiffs, your Shankaracharyas, your Ramanujams. All of them find a place in volume 3. We then go into volume 4. the epics imagined. And this is the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. So it's, uh, it is the largest volume in the series, 384 pages. It's uh, the biggest volume which we have. And again, as I said, it deals with images from the Ramayana and Mahabharata. This, ladies and gentlemen, is my absolute favorite chromolithograph. It's Sudanwan Prabhavati and actually comes from the Jainini Bharata. So that's why it goes on to the cover of that volume. 
वॉल्यूम फाइव कृष्णा लीला एंड नाटका दे वी हैव इट एंड दिस इज श्रीमद भागवतम the other hindu themes things like for example the geeta govinda the vamana uh, purana the shukaramba sambhad and then it gets into the plays because ravi varma was quite interested in classical plays so we have of course kalidasa shakuntala then you have bhava putti you have shudraka you have all of them in volume 5 and that is the last in the series this is power and enchantment so it deals with images associated with power your maharajas your british um, uh, people and then it also gets into how the ravi varma press was changing power imagery and then of course the allure of the feminine image so all of your vasantikas and all of them find a place in volume 6 this is the second largest volume it's just shy of two pages of volume 4 uh, so there you have it ladies and gentlemen six volumes Uh, 2140 odd pages over 2 lakh 10000 words over 1800 images in six volumes volume 1 has already been released and the remaining volumes are to be released over the course of the next uh, maybe few months we are, we are get to decide exactly how to spread out the release um, i was supposed to as dr nandita just said i commemorated 100 years 125 150 how could i not leave out 175 this is ravi varma's 175th birth anniversary so this is the tribute for 175 years now so i thought writing the volumes was difficult until i finished writing the volumes and press reporters called me up and then asked me sir in three lines can you tell us what's different about ravi varma <laughs> and i'm from maxta i really don't know how to explain this magnitude in three lines so i've been thinking and thinking about it and then i sort of got very diplomatic and i told uh, you know why don't you buy it and read it and understand and a very sort of smart reporter came up to me and then said that's a sales tactic so okay that's what's not going to work so here is an attempt to try and explain what is different here and how i approach it differently i think the first thing which makes it different is that i look at ravi varma in context rather than look at ravi varma in isolation till now a lot of what has been done on ravi varma is to sort of extract him out of a larger narrative and just say ravi varma did this ravi varma did this ravi varma did this ravi varma did this this is what people have done till now what i have done is to switch off the spotlight on him and to turn on the floodlight and say there were people who were working behind the scenes there were things which were going on at the time when ravi varma was working which influenced him these are the things which actually sort of helped him compose respective images so one thing which is different about how i look at it is to look at ravi varma in a larger context not just a small context but also a larger societal context because this is also a time when india is changing so how is ravi varma also engaging with that not just him but also the ravi varma press why is the ravi varma press important a lot of people till now have looked at only the paintings and said this is ravi varma well that is true that is what ravi varma did but everyone will agree that many of these paintings have just been artistic expressions but the social impact the cultural impact did not come from the paintings the cultural impact came from the chromolithographs from the press so we have to look at what actually transformed society and therefore we look at the ravi varma press and the images from the ravi varma press so therefore what makes this narrative different is that the actual protagonist in the entire series is the image in which ravi varma plays only a part so who models for him that's also part of the narrative how does the ravi varma press take it forward that's also part of the narrative how do people receive it change it love it criticize it that is also part of the narrative so when you are looking for example at lakshmi i'm just going to step and show you this so 
So when we are looking at Lakshmi, we are also talking about the girl who modeled for him in a photograph and it goes into how the actual painting was made, how the chromolithograph comes about and how even people like Pushpamala are now using it to reinvent the narrative and also get into, after the whole thing is done, get into a sort of an understanding of whether people have understood the image, received it or even rejected it. So it's not a very, uh, at times it's not a very, it's, it's an analytical narrative. It's neither deferential nor is it critical. It just gives you that this is exactly how it happens. So everything is there including Sister Nivedita's criticism, Smith's criticism, Hebel's criticism, all of them find a place in the volume. So it's a very academic way of looking at it. And having done this now, I think it's time that I get into volume one. What am I going to do today? What I'm going to do today is I'm going to show you some images which find a place in volume one. Now I'm doing the deep dive in volume one. And also sort of giving you a backstory of how sometimes I got those images because that's also quite an interesting narrative as to uh, you know, where these images were, why have they not been seen till now, why have they not been put in context till now, and I'm going to start straight off with this one. Are you able to see this? Uh, do you want to switch off the light now? Oh good, I can now see all of you. Visible? Do you want to shift? You're fine? Okay. Yes. So, this is titled The Garden Gate and it is an 1896 painting by C. Raja Rajavarma. It actually appears right in the very beginning of volume 1. What it is, is a painting of the Kilimanur Palace arch. It's, it's a very famous arch. Uh, everybody knows the arch. But nobody knows that C. Raja Rajavarma actually painted it in 1896. I have to tell you the backstory of how I actually got this image. So when I was appointed the honorary curator of the Sri Chitra Art Gallery, I had the fortune of looking at one of the earliest catalogues of the museum. And this was as early as in the 1930s, it was done by James Cousins. So one of the first things which I did was actually tally the list which was sent to me to the original catalogue and I said, hello, what? there are five paintings which are missing. Where are they? And they are quite important works and one more features here. And uh, they didn't know. Uh, they searched and they searched and it reached a stage where it was actually going to get into an inquiry because how can five paintings go missing and everybody is like, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. Finally they said, sir, please don't escalate it. Let us just search the records and they found a slip of paper which said five paintings have been sent to the Raj Bhavan for display. And no one actually knew these paintings had been sent. They didn't even know whether. So off they went to the Raj Bhavan and um, they found the five paintings. And one of them was titled The Garden Gate. I never knew which this painting was. And then photograph came in and it was the Kilimanur Palace Arch by C. Raja Rajavarma. So it actually features as one of the very, very early um, images in the book. Um, I have my designer sitting there, Ashwat, and he was very excited when he saw the image. He says, Ganesh, we're going to make this a full page, and full page it is in the volume. I'm going on to the next one, which is, yes. Would you like, may I, may I request something? Keep the questions to the end, if you don't mind. Yes, please, please, because you know what happens? I might train a thought, sort of. I hope that's okay. Yes. We are now looking at this. Not many people actually know Ravi Varma loved equestrian images. Uh, and there is a set of two watercolors uh, which Ravi Varma had painted, presumably from his time in Mysore. And both of these watercolors are sublime and absolutely beautiful. And both of them feature in volume one. Now, I just want to get into an aside on the horse. What actually happened was, I was wondering, you know, Ravi Verma loved faces of beautiful women. And there are these horse sketches, a whole series of horse sketches, which he does with great delicacy. 
and all of them actually feature in volume one. So I was actually wondering why does he like horses as you know, no other animal? And the probable interpretation is that his family deity was uh, Sasta, one of the versions of Ayyappan. And this particular temple, uh, which is part of the Kilimanjaro estate, the uh, Vahan has a horse. And what Ravi Verma does is the seal of the Kilimanjaro palace is actually sketched by him and that sketch is also there. And the actual seal is a horse. And this is probably why Ravi Verma is taking great uh, sort of interest in horse sketches and these are deliciously beautiful works. So when I was doing the series, Ashwat told me, Ganesh, we need a seal or a logo for the entire series. And he says, I don't know which. I said, the horse. We should do the horse because Ravi Verma did the horse. And uh, I wrote to the Kilimanjaro Palace and he said, may I use the horse? And they said, yes, you're allowed to use the horse for the series, which is why in all of the volumes, you will find the horse at the back. And the entire series has the horse logo. And this is actually from Ravi Verma's interest in horses. I'm moving on to another image. This is um, a, an older thing, says Kileke uh, Palat Krishna Menon. It's actually Kileke Pat Ramakrishna Menon. And for all of those who are wondering what's a lawyer got to do with art, I'm happy to tell you that Ravi Verma's first commission was by a person from the legal fraternity. He was actually a sub-judge. So it sort of validates my standing here today that Ravi Verma's career actually began by a member of the legal fraternity. This painting also was quite undiscovered until 2019. Um, I actually, I think for one of the first times it came out in public was when I was here in 2019 and I spoke. Um, at the C.P. Ramaswamy Art Foundation. This painting now was uh, unveiled to the public at the Mumbai Gallery Weekend by DAG. Um, and you know, it's actually a very interesting portrait uh, because it's one of the few portraits where Ravi Verma has very many people within a portrait. Usually it's about one or two people. But Ravi Verma's career actually begins uh, with a very complex portrait of five people. Uh, I was also very happy that the rendition had Mukambika on it because this is when Ravi Verma goes to Mukambika, comes back and his career actually begins. So this is sort of a, a, a very pivotal moment uh, for Ravi Verma's career. I'm moving on to another one and this is, of course this, is, this has been featured in the past as well. It's uh, one of Ravi Verma's, I think one of his rare uh, uh, paintings which also combines a landscape because there's quite a resplendent landscape here. Now this painting uh, interestingly has been interpreted by me and the interpretation has been um, uh, sort of been the subject matter of quite a lot of debate. You see Ravi Verma was very careful when it came to uh, composition of power portraits and here is actually the scene of the Maharaja greeting the Duke of Buckingham. And if you actually look at what Ravi Verma does, he puts a man right in front of the handshake. Can you see that? And actually obscures the handshake. Now why would anyone do that? When you are talking about, a, you know, a, a today's diplomatic things, you would have these people shaking hands and people uh, photographing and it's a huge thing to actually shake hands and to sign contracts and things like that. Why would Ravi Verma obscure the handshake? So it's been interpreted by me and if you actually look at quite a lot of people they're in a state of shock they're doing that it could either be deference but I think what Ravi Verma actually does here he intentionally obscures the handshake to say and not to say because within the Indian circuit no one would touch a Maharaja in those days. But with the British, it was quite, I mean, even today we prefer a namaste to an actual handshake. And certainly during COVID, we loved that. Uh, but uh, Ravi Verma is a diplomat even with the way in which he composes an image to see, to see and not to see at the same point of time. This is also sort of a, an indication of how Ravi Verma is able to navigate uh, through 
sometimes contrasting ideologies. So this is one of the pictures here. I'm also getting into some of the other material which finds a place in the book. A lot of the original catalogs have been examined, the direct catalogs. So a lot of fiction has been eliminated in the process of writing the book. A lot of people say, for example, Ravi Verma's first international exhibition was at Vienna. So if you look at the actual catalog at the Vienna exhibition, Ravi Verma does not feature. So things like that. So it's a very meticulously done work. And here is one of the catalogs where Ravi Verma does feature. And it's in 1883. 1883, for all the people who know Ravi Verma, was during the reign of Vishakam Tirunal, Maharaja. Now, a lot of people actually say Vishakam Tirunal and Ravi Verma never got along. But it was Vishakam Tirunal who actually sent state portraits to, of Ravi Verma to a Calcutta exhibition during his reign, painted during his reign. So it sort of questions whether the uh, animosity was really there. I don't think so. I think the Maharaja was a very pragmatic man. Why would he fight with an artist of all people? So, you know, it sort of uh, re-evaluates the whole thing. We also have a lot of sketches. So for those of you all who want to know how the artist worked, uh, you have to look at this series because it has a whole bunch of sketches. And the sketches have also lent themselves to a lot of interpretation. This, for example, is um, probably an artistic rendition of the Travancore State insignia. Uh, people wanted to know why would you have a shang and the two. And the beautiful thing about it is that this logo of the state of Kerala today still has some of these elements today. The shang and all of that continues to resonate in um, the uh, state of Kerala's uh, insignia as of today. It also looks at how Ravi Verma's pictures were received even at the time when he was alive. And here is one of the rare ones. It says a prince on a tricycle and it's Martha and Tavarma. And what actually happens very interestingly is this painting is exhibited at the Simla exhibition and a newspaper reporter critiques this painting and says, "If uh, why should a prince of Travancore be wearing western attire? Why is he not wearing Indian attire? So even at the time when Ravi Verma was painting it, Ravi Verma's paintings were actually being critiqued. And they say, why it, it appears that if this is the trend, then everybody is going to be wearing Western attire, which actually, if you see in the hall, most of us are wearing Western attire. So this is actually something which, even when Ravi Verma is there, but this is also poignant to say that at the time when India was also changing, uh, Ravi Verma was there to capture that particular trajectory. Sampat Rao Gaikwad. Okay. Sampat Rao Gaikwad. Uh, published for the first time and is from the Royal Gaikwad collection. Uh, the Royal Gaikwad collection's paintings have been published ever so frequently, but this appears for the first time. And there's a reason, there's actually a backstory to why it was not published in any of the earlier publications. Is because this painting had been completely painted over, including the signature had been obscured. But between the last publication and mine, they had restored it and they had removed the overpainting and it revealed a signature. So um, they were very happy to make it available to uh, this book series. I also have to acknowledge them because they've been extremely um, uh, uh, very sort of supportive and encouraging. In fact, this is the only series which has the maximum number of works from the Royal Gaikwad collection, the Baroda collection, uh, including things which uh, the marriage of Rama, uh, Ravi Verma, Sdaropadi Vastraharan, all of them for the first time feature in this series. And now slowly getting into how, uh, sort of, into the play between the sketch and the painting. So these two actually feature in Rupika's work. But there's actually a little backstory to what was going on and what was Ravi Verma's interest in it. In the diary of Sri Rajaraja Verma, I mean, all of us would think student studying. Uh, 
But in the diary of Sri Raja Raja Varma, he says, uh, we all went to Sampatrao's house to see the new gas lamp. And if you look at that and this, right in front is the gas lamp. And he's given a context by putting a person there studying this, that and the other. Just to sort of give you an idea that, you know, the way in which we are looking at it, to actually how Ravi Varma and see Raja Raja Varma by looking at their own paintings is very different. And in both of them, right in front is the lamp. And behind it are some all these other people who are sort of lending it context. Uh, what is also very interesting about this, and this is where I interpret this and another work, is how Ravi Varma is playing with light. So if you look at the man in the foreground who is under the gas lamp, he is at study. But there is another man at the back, and it occurs in two works of his. And he is under what we could call a lesser light. Uh, it is, uh, Ravi Varma actually uses light as a metaphor of empowerment in all of his works. Uh, and this is one of the two secular works where he uses light as a source to indicate empowerment. Anyone who is under the light is getting empowered. Anyone in the shade is under a lesser light. And this occurs also in his mythological works where you can actually see Kichakan Sairantri, for example, the one in the light whose Kichaka is completely forceful and she shades herself because she is not that powerful. So it, it, the volumes get into an assessment of the possible ways of interpreting it using various things. Kathakali, light, all of that takes place in these volumes. The Brave Pusmavati features again for the first time. It's actually a very important work for Ravi Varma and it is referred to extensively in letters uh, written by Ravi Varma. When Ravi Varma is, uh, is trying to set up a picture gallery in Trivandrum, uh, the Maharaja asks him, can you send us a list of paintings? And the first painting in the list is the Brave Kusmavati. Uh, for the longest time, we did not know whether the painting was there, whether it had been damaged or whether it had been of course, whether it had been painted or not. Uh, but if you look at the newspaper articles uh, associated with Ravi Varma's works, the painting was actually exhibited in Bombay Fine Arts Society exhibition. And there's this huge article only about this painting and telling you the whole story of what is happening here and, uh, uh, you know, how Tilak Dev is trying to kill somebody and then the woman says, no, you will not touch my lover. There's this whole uh, uh, discussion about the painting, but the painting had never been seen. A small black and white photograph of it appears in a 1911 publication. And uh, quite recently the painting was discovered and uh, I was able to identify it as the Brave Kusmavati because of the black and white photograph in a 1911 work. Uh, so this is a very important work because it also sets about a course of another democratic process of the museum culture and Raja Ravi Varma. This features both in volume 1 and 2. Dhatri. Now, this portrait is of uh, one of the uh, Ranis of Enguna, uh, Kolongodu. Uh, the reason why it features in as a major work in my uh, book and it features as a full page image is because it's the first jointly signed portrait of Ravi Varma and Sri Raja Raja Varma. There are references that Ravi Varma and C. Raja Raja Varma were jointly executing paintings from as early as 1878. In the diary actually he says, we did this, we did this, we did this, we did this, including the Baroda commissions were jointly done. But C. Raja Raja Varma never actually, was the joint effort was never actually acknowledged until this particular point of time and this is in 1904, which is very sad, I'm sorry, 1903, because it's very sad because in 1905 January, Raja Raja Varma finally died. Uh, so the actual acknowledgement of a joint and a collective legacy building for the first time actually happens only with this painting, which is why it is, um, it's a very important thing in the larger narrative of Ravi Varma. Another watercolor. 
in, a, in the divisional archives in Mysore, there is a letter saying, this is a proposal of the paintings which I want to paint for the Maharaja of Mysore. Some of them get commissioned, which is now on display at the Jagan Mohan Palace. But the second tranche of paintings actually never got commissioned. And one of them was the Dasara procession, the Maharaja's Dasara procession. It never got commissioned, but there is a very rare watercolor of the nocturnal procession in the storage of the Sri Chitra Art Gallery. And the, I brought it in for the publication here. This is C. Raja Raja Verma's last painting. And again, it's in Mysore. And what is interesting is, this was one of those five paintings which we discovered in the uh, Raj Bhavan. Such an important work is not on display at the Sri Chitra Art Gallery, but is languishing in the Raj Bhavan. I, I am thoroughly miffed. I've been trying to bring it back to the Sri Chitra Art Gallery, but you know how red tape is. Uh, but this is Sri Raja Raja Verma's final work, last work, about two, three months before he finally dies. So this again features in this volume. Now I'm getting into how Ravi Verma actually composed the images. And uh, looking into, now again, as I told you, looking at it in context. So let us look at Bharani Tarinal Raja Raja Verma. Bharani Tarinal Raja Raja Verma was Ravi Verma's maternal uncle. A lot of people would, uh, would attribute the change to uh, from traditional form of painting to perspective realism to Ravi Verma. But the reality was actually goes a little behind and it was Bharani Tirunal Raja Raja Verma who actually did it. Uh, two of his Tanjo style paintings, which one of which you, which you see on top of your screen, is on display at the Sri Chitra Art Gallery. But two of his works which he does using academic realism is in storage. And one of them you are seeing at the bottom of the screen. Both, all the four paintings of Parani Tirunal Raja Raja Verma feature in volume one. Both of them which are on display and both of them which are in storage. Because this is very important to demonstrate that this is the sh point when the shift takes place. And the shift actually takes place with Parani Tirunal Raja Raja Verma, not Ravi Verma. Ravi Verma then takes it on and then makes it what it is. But that attribution goes here. So you know this is the kind of fiction which is uh, undone. Uh, where we actually say this is what this man did and Ravi Verma of course took it forward. So uh, one, of the, uh, one of the great discoveries. Again coming to sketches. This is actually how Ravi Verma sketched jewellery. So if you actually look, he very quickly delineates it. Usha Balakrishna has spoken extensively about it, but this is the actual sketch where he very, uh, this must be a Vodhyanam or something. I, I don't know, the ladies would probably know more what that is, but I'm assuming it's a Vodhyanam. And Ravi Verma, I think, very quickly goes in, looks at how the jewelry looks. This is where the emeralds go, this is where the rubies go. Very quickly, it must have been, I'm assuming, must have been of a very important or a royal sitter because he would not have had the opportunity to make this royal person sit for a very long period of time. Person would have come sad, he would have very quickly delineated how the jewelry looks and then of course transferred it onto another painting. We are talking also about poetry. In fact, Sri Kumar was asking me just now about poetry and Ravi Verma. One of the things which Ravi Verma does get inspired by is poetry and this is an adaptation of Veena Nomruk. Um, what is beautiful about this series is that Ravi Verma had executed a series of preparatory sketches for it. And uh, I think the most beautiful one I put on the screen, but there are I think about six of these sketches for Veena Numruk, um, which feature in the volume. Here is another sketch. Is that visible? Huh? Yeah. Of sculpture. So this is, uh, and just to sort of put it next to a similar sort of sculpture, to tell you that Ravi Verma is actually sitting there and sketching in these details. Um, it's a lot of hard work to actually go there, sit there and actually sketch it out. And it's in quite a lot of detail if you look at the sketch. Um, I'm assuming it is 
from uh, Dwarapalaka of a temple which is very close to the Kilimanjaro palace. But if you actually place them next to each other, you see how it, almost similar they are. This is uh, the influence of sculpture, architectural details, all of which uh, also go finally into the final painting. The series also tries to get rid of a lot of fiction associated with Ravi Varma. Uh, so a lot of people, you know, they simply come up with these stories and conjecture that Ravi Varma was influenced by Olymp uh, uh, Manes Olympia. It's not true. Because look at this. They say that this reclining Nair lady was inspired by Edward Manes Olympia. Uh, this is where I think, you know, the lawyer has to come in because when you are talking about an influence, you can't generically say there is one painting somewhere in Italy which looks similar and there is one painting in Kerala which sort of looks similar and therefore they are inspired by one another. It takes a lot more for you to be able to say this inspired that. And what the page which you are seeing on the left of your screen is from Ravi Verma's library. So Ravi Verma had this huge library of books, uh, most of them German books, the art journal, the um, uh, Royal, uh, Royal Academy pictures. It's a huge, huge library. I have to tell you that when the Kilimanjaro Palace gave me the opportunity of researching it, it took me 24 days of continuous scanning, like a Xerox wala, to actually catalog the entire set in Kilimanjaro, the photographs, the books, and then I came back with something like about 12,000 images on my laptop, and then the comparison is done. They're saying, this is this, this is this, this is this. That is the kind of, you can't simply randomly say, ha, that looks somewhat similar, and therefore it is like this. Kerala and Burcino. There is no comparison at all. You simply can't keep doing random comparisons like that. There has to be some sort of academic backing to the kind of comparison which is done. Now look at this image. And if you look how exactly similar it is, the pattern of the carpet is the same, the pose of the woman is exactly the same, the position of the book is exactly the same. And Ravi Varma had this ability of taking an absolutely western image and making it look so Indian that it's only when you look at my book that you're going to actually say, my god, this is actually a western image. I'm going to step out of this talk and actually show you one of them in volume 6. Indian image is this one. This is a German image. 
That's the only Indian image which you are able to see. What kind of criticism are you bringing? Okay, so sort of deliberates on it. it this is going to disrupt the Ravi Verma space big time. Okay, I'm looking forward to it. I'm actually looking forward to someone criticizing me also. That's what, anyway, I'm sure that will also happen. Let's move on to another. We finished European photography. And a whole series of photographs reveal themselves. Now, there's a backstory to how these photographs actually come to me. Um, you know, when, I don't want to sound like a voodoo person or something, but when you start working on a project, there's something which takes you over and consumes you. You don't know why you're doing, what you're doing, anything like that. So on trip three to Kilimanjaro, Ramavarma ji, I was sitting in the Uttapara eating with all of these people. I had a flight to catch back to Bangalore. I have to come back to work and earn money to pay for all of this. Um, and I'm actually going back with a scanner. Sharan keeps teasing me by saying, you're the only guy who walked around with a scanner. Now I'm walking around with a bag full of these books. Uh, and I'm walking down the steps and something prompts me to ask Ram Varma ji, where is the box? To this day, I don't know why I asked this question. And he was startled. He says, how do you know of the box? I said, I don't know. So he takes me all the way into some inner depth of the palace and there is an unattended box which has not been attended for I don't even know for how long and uh, we open it and the lid breaks open and inside were all of the photographs including the photographs for Lakshmi, Ahalya, Mohini, uh, many of the models, Rajivai Mulgankar is there, Gauri is there. Um, all of these very important models which people have never spoken of till now. Rajivai Mulgankar, ladies and gentlemen, is the girl who posed for Lakshmi. So for all of you who have been praying to Lakshmi for 125 years, you have been praying to Rajivai Mulgankar. Okay. And it actually gets into who she is. So you want a further revelation, she was a Devadasi. So if you, but the beauty of it is, you know, that's what Ravi Varma does. He takes a normal woman and makes a goddess out of her. Um, I'm sure all wives want their husbands to do that. But uh, <laughs> that's what Ravi Verma does to a simple picture. I'm not going to be quoted on that. Huh? So that remains within this room. But this is what Ravi Verma is doing with photography. But one of the very exceptional photographs and for the Ravi Verma legacy is very important is this one. You may be actually thinking, the sitters obscured, what are you talking about? The question was how involved was Ravi Verma with the photographic aspect of it? We all know Ravi Verma composed the image, the painting, but did he actually compose the photograph as well? And when I was looking at this, I found something exceptionally rare. And that is when Ravi, when this photograph is being taken, inadvertently, Ravi Verma falls in the reflection of the mirror. So you can actually see him in the mirror over there, and you can see him sort of, I think, instructing this guy, sit like this, sit like that, or telling the photographer, move it about, or something like that. You can actually see him doing something there. You know, sort of makes it relevant to the actual process of the making of the picture. But how, how much did the studio use these photographs? They extensively feature throughout the volumes, the Lakshmi, the Ahalya, um, you have Gauri who was one of his earliest models much before. You know a lot of people are talking about um, Anjani by Malpekar, but Anjani by Malpekar was actually not at all as involved as certain of the other models like Gauri. Gauri was very important. The coquette painting, that was Gauri. You actually see her holding up the pallu of a sari in a photograph. The exact jewelry finds a place in the earliest version of uh, the coquette. Uh, we don't talk about her. Who was she? She was a very famous dancer. She was actually one of the dancers who had been taken by the Maharani of uh, um, Tanjavur, Chimnabai, at the time when she is getting married to Saiji Rao Gaikwad. And she is part of the entourage which goes over there. And when Ravi Verma goes there, uh, more or less at the same time, um, 
he is very fascinated. Uh, of course, he, he comes to know Gauri. But what is interesting, you'll find that in volume one, uh, sort of stepping on an aside for a bit. A lot of these photographs actually had notations at the back. So we actually know who they are. So one of the things which I did was when I was uh, scanning the front, I also scanned the back because I wanted to know who many of these people were. And there are names, many, very many names, including the Maharajas there, Maharana Vodaipur is there, Nizam of Hyderabad is there. All of them are there. Uh, Rajibayar model of Bombay, that is there. The only photograph which has an honorific is Gauri. He says, Gauraji, taken at Banaras. And Gauri was called Gaura in Baroda. Uh, so he evidently had a very sort of respect for uh, a great amount of respect for this girl and uh, treated her with, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, decorum which was required of a palace artist. Uh, so Ravi Verma uses Gaura in very many of his works. Here is another one. This we know is Raji by Malagamkar and this is a painting by C. Raja Raja Verma. So the studio was also using very many of these photographs and if you actually put the photograph next to the painting, even the creases of the sari find a place onto the painting. You know, those little wrinkles, the way in which she's standing, this, that. And if you look at, she's the girl who posed for Lakshmi, by the way. Look at how young she is. She must have been barely in her late teens, I'm assuming. And there she is posing. And she was the Devadasi, um, who, uh, as I said, also posed for Lakshmi. As much as we, I have been able to to document some of these people, there is a whole section which I was not able to find who these people are. But we do know that they were associated with the studio. Now, who is, this is a photograph and the painting. But we don't know who she is. So I'm sort of trying to get to the point to tell you as much as we've done six volumes, they still really a lot more which has to be done in the Ravi Varma space. So, with this, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to conclude for this evening. executing that series of commissions for the Baroda, Baroda. Palace. Mm -hmm. How do we know that is because the Maharaja, if this is in the Baroda State Archives, is that the Maharaja honors both Ravi Verma and Raja Raja Verma and gives them diamond rings. Now, he would not have done it to Raja Raja Verma if he was also not part of it. Having said the, uh, and of course the Udapur Commission, the Ud Udapur Commission also speaks extensively of joint work. But what happens is, um, uh, and Pudukote, Pudukote is when actually they say we jointly did it, 1878. Uh, but what happens is, it is, it requires a lot more research and an in-depth understanding of the brush stroke for us to actually get, see these are aspects which I think people have to take this narrative forward once these six volumes come in. The next thing is going to be to examine the Damayanti painting and to examine the brush stroke of the face, for example. Huh? And then to examine the brush stroke of the pillars. Then you will be able to get a fingerprint sort of thing as to which portion of the brush stroke 
was Ravi Varma's signature, which portion of it was Raja Raja Varma's signature. But that requires a lot of sort of, a lot more work on Ravi Varma. So the media says, that uh, Ravi Varma never permitted Raja Raja Varma to do the portrait and the face and all of that. He only there allowed is him no to such do. No, there is no such thing that he prevented anybody. No. A lot in the research which I have done, has there been a reference to a prevention? There are many references to Raja Raja Varma telling, you know, uh, this is in addition to the important work of my brother in the Udaipur Commission, he says, I'm painting the landscapes in addition to the important work of assisting. Raja Raja Varma himself was sort of putting himself on back burner. But I don't think Ravi Varma would have intentionally prevented anybody. See, this is where all this fiction comes in by saying, you know, no, there's no such thing. I also wondered why uh, a book on Ravi Varma that you published, the first picture is of Raja Raja Varma with the Kalimano Arch. Why did you start with The him? first paragraph itself is Sri Raja Raja Varma. Why did you start with him rather than Ravi Varma? Because it is the intent to say that Ravi Varma was best um, showcased in the context of this huge set of people around him. The whole, the whole intent of the volume so the, the whole intent of the series is to put Ravi Varma in a larger context and not examine him in isolation. Ravi Varma also had a son. Yes. His second son also painted his name was Rama Varma. Yes. Is there any reference to him in any Yes, of yes. In uh, volume 4 features him, uh, letters of him feature in volume 1 as well, yes. There are a lot more people, I mean, not just Rama Varma, there are lots of people who sort of absorb the image and took it. Um, hello, my name is Maitri. Hi. Um, so, I looked at your, uh, the reclining Naya lady portrait, and the first thing that came to my mind was how you used, uh, how you said that light portrayed empowerment, right? And one thing that, the first thing that caught my eye in that portrait was the fact that the Naya lady was drawn in a beautiful lighting, while the girl behind her, her servant, was drawn very, you know, in a very dull manner, right? Do you think, and this might be a far reach on my part, but do you think that there could be a Savarna commentary on that, a Savarna commentary um, based on a feminist perspective as well? Feminism and Ravi Varma is a very interesting... <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, let's get into, there's nothing wrong in talking about uh, Ravi Varma in the, as a champion of feminism. One, two, what you are bringing up about depicting inequities in life. Correcting wrong and talking about it. Society has never been equal, will never be equal. Okay. Certainly when you're talking from the legal perspective, uh, we acknowledge equality as also inequality as being part of the larger way of way in which society works. Did Ravi Varma depict uh, power within the image? Most certainly he did. What were the various compositional mechanisms which he used? He used many of them. One of which was skin complexion. One of which was skin complexion. Did Ravi Varma whitewash was a question which was asked to me in one of my talks. I don't think he whitewashed, but he used skin complexion. So if you look at the reclining Nair lady, and you look at the change in the complexion between person in the front and person at the back, you will know the power play there itself. You look at the lady giving arms, she's a Tamil Ayer lady who's dropping a coin to somebody as she's exiting the temple. Uh, there is a wonderful article by C. Raja Raja Varma in, an, in a magazine and he says the Tamil Ayer women were not as fair as the other Brahmin women, but Ravi Varma paints that girl very fair. So there is an intentional alteration of the complexion. This not only is in a society or a simple narrative as a reclining Nair lady, you will also see it in his mythological or narrative works. You will see it across. You will see it, for example, in 
uh, uh, the Mysore collection. Victory of Indrajit. Uh, Ravana Dark. The female is very fair. Matsyaganda, who is the, uh, the extremely fair. The fisher man, extremely dark. So he did use complexion. This was one thing which he used. But the greater compositional was Kathakali stage convention, which is dealt with. Actually, I should, did not get into that. Kathakali stage convention is a huge influence on Ravi Verma. In Kathakali stage, I don't know how many of you have followed Kathakali. So if you actually look at Kathakali stage convention, and it is, it is very academically mentioned in volume one, is that in Kathakali stage convention, the powerful person is to the right of the servient person. So when you are looking, a person on that side of the stage, which will actually be to my right, is the more powerful person. The person to the left, to where, towards where I am, is the servient person. And you look at all of Raghavarma's works, they like that. Take for example, you take uh, Vishwamitra and Menaka. At that point in the narrative, Vishwamitra is more powerful. So he will be to the right. And Menaka slowly coming towards the left. But then when the deed is done and the child is born and she is bullying him with the child and saying, here is the, uh, here is Shakuntala, who is a symbol of your defeat, she is to his right. So Ravi Verma uses very many such things to uh, depict power play. This is only just one of them. Yes. Most of the leading ladies of the portraits, if I could call them that, um, they are shown to have fair skin. And uh, in your opinion, right, for say, the after Ravi Verma, the generation, my generation that's looking at his paintings now, do you have any opinions on how that might have affected our generation as viewers? Absolutely, it did. Just like the Barbie talk. No, I mean, we are, when we are talking about stereotyping, when we are talking about societal stereotyping, um, what happens is, I don't think Ravi Verma would have intended it like that, but the way in which society receives it becomes like that. So, uh, I, did Ravi Verma intend stereotypification? No. Uh, and many of these were actually enhanced by the Ravi Verma press. So Ravi Verma did not have a direct hand in any of that which happened. Uh, for example, coming back to that lady giving arms, it becomes a chromolithic of called Mandodri. In the Mandodri, the um, skin complexion is contrasted even more. He becomes darker, she becomes fairer. But in the painting, it's not like that. So I don't think Ravi Verma intended it to be... Uh, you know, as you said, but you never know how society receives certain things. Like I mentioned also the Barbie doll. I mean, there's now a lot of thing of making a dark Barbie doll, for example. And now there's this move to say, you know, make the figure of the Barbie doll more proportionate to actually how normal human beings are. This sort of debate will continue and will always be there. Yes. Instead of the bias that we see in those pictures, we can even view it as a focal point which is very important. So the important character comes to the front and the other people are secondary. So the criticism can be done that way also or evaluation, appreciation can be viewed in a different direction also. Uh, I don't, I, if you look at the scenes where na uh, within a narrative scene, I don't want to get into portraits because portraits would have been commissioned for power only. So I don't think that would uh, have, uh, have any effect. But if you are looking at the narrative compositions, you see there is actually an evolution. So you know we have to, because I'm talking to you, I, I suppose I, you'll understand what I'm trying to say. 
if you look at the evolution of the narrative scenes by Ravi Varma, I would, there are two phases, largely two phases, the Baroda phase and the Mysore phase. Hmm? The Baroda phase does not really lend to too much of an analysis because the maximum number of images in any is maximum two, three, and except in that scene of uh, Draupadi and all of that, where there are many. But in the Mysore phase, there are very many people who are all playing it. And by the time it comes to the Mysore phase, I don't think he is much interested in frontality of the image. He is happy to recede Ravana to the back, although at that point of time, Ravana is the center of the universe. Even Indra is going to come down to him and make uh, you know, the release of Indra. So he actually pushes Ravana somewhere to the back. He puts the nymph in front. He doesn't, he's not accentuating the main figures to go in front. The same thing you will even see in Bhishma's, uh, this one. The cause of the whole Mahabharata is Satyavati, and she is somewhere to one mula. So I don't think he was very interested by then. Maybe the Baroda commissions he was. But Baroda only had two people maximum. There's a gentleman here. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Ramayana Mahabharata is written in uh, different languages. These two <coughs> Mahabharata Ramayana is written in different languages. Also in the drama, also it is enacted by people, different drama groups also. I want to know which he follows, which source Valmi. Uh, to bring out the painting. I want to know whether it is his own imaginary or he is adding something to the original resource. That I, is my question. He follows Valmiki. I'll tell you why he follows Valmiki. Is because in Ravi Varma's depiction of the time when uh, Ravana comes to, as, as a sort of mendicant to allure, uh, ask Sita to go, there is no Lakshman Rekha in that picture. But in a later chromolithograph, there is a Lakshman Rekha in the picture. And uh, uh, the Lakshman Rekha is not in the Valmiki Ramayana, to the best of my knowledge. So Ravi Varma followed Valmiki quite diligently. This is one. Second is, you know that picture of uh, the abduction of Sita by uh, Jatayu slain and all of that. The actual color of the sari is also mentioned in the Ramayana. So he follows that. Ravi Varma followed the Ramayana and the Srimad Bhagavatam with great amount of diligence. Uh, Mahabharata, I think to some extent he takes liberties, but iconographic images he takes lot of liberties lot of liberties he takes, but those are the ones which have crystallized in our mind by saying this is like this is Saraswati. But if you actually look at uh, the source, uh, uh, not Dr. Nandita Krishna is here, so I am not using the word source, um, later interpretations like uh, Shri Tatvanidhi, uh, Pratima Kosha, uh, or if you look at, uh, what's the other one, Gopinath Rao, Gopinath Rao, Gopinath Rao's works, or if you look Ha, elements, that's four volumes. Um, uh, S.K. Ramchandra was six volumes, Pratima Kosha. And of course, the Shri Tatvanidhi is nine volumes, which most people have not seen. But if you actually uh, uh, examine those uh, source, I, sorry, not source, she's here, she'll be clear. Uh, but if you actually look at those volumes, you will discover that Ravi Varma takes very many liberties with the uh, uh, with the uh, uh, divinities intended for worship. I think it's very fascinating. Okay, I think he, since he is uh, your friend, so last question. Shri Kumar, I can't see you. There's someone blocking you like that handshake. You've spoken about his brother. Yes. Uh, have you written about his sister? Yes. No, you can't. Uh, you can't eliminate Mangla Bai. In fact, there is quite a bit of Mangla Bai in uh, volume. Even I'm forgetting which one. Volume four, um, where you know that painting of uh, uh, the marriage of Rama in Baroda. Uh, Mangalabha executed a copy of it 
and there's this rare photograph of that painting. We don't know where the painting is. Uh, and at the bottom, you can see the signature Mangla Bai. Yeah, and she also features in volume five. Uh, yeah, yes. So thank you very much. I'm going to now request Mrs. Ranjita Ashoka from Madras uh, Book Club to give a vote of thanks. Krishna and the C.P. Ramaswamy Ayer Foundation for giving the Madras Book Club this opportunity to partner with them. Thank you very much, Dr. Nandita Krishna. Sri Ganesh Shivaswamy, thank you for this evening. Ravi Varma is such a part of all our lives, it's almost an unconscious one. He's there in our puja rooms, he's there everywhere. And in fact, he influenced how we even view divinity in our minds, a divinity which we ascribe to human subjects. You brought us the result of your passionate immersion into Ravi Varma's work. In this very beautiful, perfect environment, you took us on a journey into Ravi Varma's world, set his work in a social context, gave us an idea of the threads of connections that wove his world with the gripping backstories, the symbolism, all of it with a touch of humor and lightness, which actually enhanced the deep commitment you obviously have for your particular magnificent obsession. Today was about the first volume, in a six-volume series, a fascinating beginning to what promises to be an unparalleled, exhaustive collection, which in time will prove a legacy in itself. And we wish you all the very best, Sri Ganesh Swami. And on behalf of the C.P. Ramaswamy Ayur Foundation and the Madras Book Club, thank you all for being here this evening. 